Feuerbach consequently does not see that the religious sentiment is itself a social product, and that the abstract individual that he analyzes belongs in reality to a particular social form. This is probably the most important section, regardless of the importance of the first thesis and the last thesis. But it is also an expansion of the sixth thesis. But for whom is it important? Why, it is important for all Marxists, those worth their salt at least. To keep the signified message of the seventh thesis. Why is it important for all Marxists? Really, what is the signified message of the thesis? Tis important for the upcoming reasons I shall state right now. The first reason is the abstraction or first universalization of a particular social product. Yet why does it appear to be a first universalization to us and not Feuerbach? Tis for us a first universalization, for he has taken one of the many social products or particular products of the superstructure and pitted that as its own unique being that cannot be derived from the social order or the base superstructure of society. Yet Feuerbach doesn't know of the dual chromatic dialectic, it is the base superstructure. He doesn't understand the primacy of the economy over society and the superstructure, and, nevertheless, he knows not how the superstructure is inter interdependent on, on its base, like how a base is interdependent of its superstructure. So he hides his ignorance of ideology and the economy with his conflict of religion, later deriving a history of religion that inevitably produces religious, religious sentiment as the force of change. Yet because of the fact that it is a mere abstraction and it lacks any explanatory power, it falls flat on itself being a universal. Thus, why religious sentiment is a particularity of social products because it is one of the many pieces that plays in the formation and maintenance of a superstructure. The second reason is also another abstraction, but on what we covered in the last thesis that being the abstract individual. Feuerbach made this thought for the same reasons as he made the thought of religious sentiment. And we can discredit him and point out what particularity it actually belongs in. Yet, what makes it more annoying is that it belongs to social forms instead of social products. This ultimately allows Feuerbach's claims of abstract individuals and religious sentiment to stay afloat in his head. The form of an abstract individual is sustained but always in conflict with the content of religious sentiment which that is sustained by the form that being of the abstract individual. But that's merely a one-sided view of how humans are in their daily life and why religious sentiment continues to mock about in the world. 
this relationship is a mere metaphysical relationship that doesn't explain why the other relationships don't matter and why these are considered primary relationships. To now finally end the build-up in a style of to how Aristotle defined things in his works, in fact, now can only the signified message come out. That being this. We cannot force particulars to be universals. Marx stumps his foot down pretty clearly here. If you possess a one-sided analysis, then you act not only metaphysically, but you also bear an incomplete analysis. The reason Feuerbach is metaphysical here, despite being a young Hegelian himself, is the fact that he managed to formulate a one-sided analysis that bears no consideration to the bland reality nor the other relationships present throughout the superstructures, nor no care for us humans that often subjectivize or make more than what something is in reality. All social life is essentially practical. All mysteries which led theory to mysticism find their rational solution in human practice and in the comprehension of this practice. Now we are at the point where all the following theses are built up to the final thesis. You could say a certain Aristotelian way of defining things. Now this thesis isn't only calling out mystification, but it also points us to where we have to go whenever we find ourselves lost in thought or queasy of what really is the case. This thesis can rightfully be related to one of Engel's aphorisms. An ounce of practice is worth a ton of theory. Regardless, this is basically the Marxist slap to all those that try to make one-sided views and or mysticism of a topic that doesn't benefit from mysticism or one-sided views. Yet if this was humanity's common sense, then we wouldn't need Marx and Engels to say this. Yet I would also say that this has an iota of importance like the last thesis. That being it states clearly the dialectical materialist line of social life. That it can only mean to be practical despite existing in an end despite existing in anti-practical ways as well. Nevertheless, it also states that theory, which has questions of what it is trying to solve, can learn from practice and develop their comprehension of practice as to actually find their rational answers. Yet before I move on, let's touch on a bit of mysticism why is it bad per se? Well, it has to do with the fact that it merely stops everything in its tracks, makes us pathologize any answer to why we stopped, and distorts our perception of the situation we find ourselves in. The only way to root it out without directly attacking the mysticism is to indirectly use the practice that has been expanded and also use the comprehension of practice to root out the mysticism that nests itself in theory.
the highest point reached by contemplative materialism, that is, materialism which does not comprehend sensuousness as practical activity, is the contemplation of single individuals and of civil society. Now this thesis with the next one makes it clear that they are interdependent of each other while still the build up to the above thesis. Now interdependent in what way? That they play off each other and develop each other to the point where if we ignored the other the thesis then the other is ironically made less individual and weaker as a result of that. Now, all these theses are interdependent to each other in one way or another, but these two, I state, rather has a connection. In this case, an excess really is this connection that cannot be denied, but is hard to truly state a right what it is. Such is the case of all excesses. But, that, but that's probably because of all the philosophical reading that I've done over the years that makes me imagine this excess that I feel is there but maybe isn't. I want to state that out right now. In any case, even if you couldn't see the excess that I perceive, the two don't lose anything of value, of importance, if we cannot see this excess. But let's move on to the ninth thesis. This thesis probably is the biggest summation, other than the tenth thesis, of all the previous theses while still dignifying them in any case. This thesis states outright how a dialectical and historical materialist sees what contemplative materialism is. It is that it fails to comprehend the notion of sensuousness as practical activity the philosophy of abstract individuals and a mere philosophy that unconsciously serves to play out and restrict itself inside the domain of bourgeois society. Now you may be wondering why civil is used here instead of bourgeois society. That is the case out of one respect, while there may be more, as I like to say right now. This one respect is the state, the current society, in power, and how it, even at a young age, was forcing everything in the superstructure of the past society to bend over to the capitalist base and be reformulated to capitalism's own survival and expansion in any particular area. Thusly, contemplative materialism, though at its time a freer materialism, was still bounded in the ideology of capitalism, and was later serviced as a venting out of frustration for those that weren't dialecticians or metaphysical idealists. It is only freer that it could have been revolutionary, well, as long as it sees itself as revolutionary, but unconsciously, it'll only help to reproduce it, capitalism, under slightly different conditions, or services to help stabilize and suppress and repress anti-capitalist sentiment as a way to upkeep capitalism without making capitalism do the job itself directly.
The standpoint of the old materialism is civil society. The standpoint of the new is human society or social humanity. Though I had touched upon this in the last section, let me name the unnamed creature, that of class character, which isn't alien to this channel, and now officially has to be named and dissected in order to make sense of this thesis. If one is lost, it's still confused. Now, as I mentioned in the third Worker's Truth podcast episode, that being the one on capitalist censorship, in my portion, when I was speaking, class character ultimately concerns itself of the united class consciousness of a particular class. It sets out what the class needs to do in order to survive in a particular society, but also the desires of that class that inevitably causes conflict. Class character also determines if something is merely an agent of the ruling class, a reactionary or kind of revolutionary, or a revolutionary agent that helps the working class. Now, why is class character important to mention here? Well, it services to tell us why materialism under the two societies are differentiable in spite of having the same content or having the possibility of having the same content. Just because of their standpoint or class character and how they shape themselves in order to support the superstructure they desire to make stable out of. Or old or contemplative materialism seeks to merely explain away or make natural any phenomenon of civil society. It is the superstructure of civil society. Even when it does amazing things to show the beauty of nature or how things really are. They still have an ideological basis to support civil society in some way. The new materialism seeks to root out civil society and seeks to establish a world that shall never return to civil society and help build a future for humanity. Thusly, the class character of these two materialisms, really the form of these materialisms, are completely different despite having the same content or possibility to have the same content. For as, to paraphrase something out of Zizek, for facts are impoverished in themselves to really tell us what is actually going on, and can often be used to justify current society if left without a bias to deter reactionary slash counter-revolutionary ideologues and ideologies. Philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Now, we are at the last thesis of Marx's thoughts on Feuerbach. All certainly play off each other and inevitably leads up to this last frustration that has to be stated to satiate our limits. Finally, the definition has been laid out and the logical conclusion of this new materialism has come about to tell us of its divine duty. 
that divine duty being that it must help change the world once it has interpreted the world in and for itself. For this, new materialism cannot just muck about interpreting for interpretation's sake. Even if that interpretation had brought about some change, what makes the change beneficial and whom is it beneficial for? Thusly, this new materialism will have to establish a philosophy that seeks to change the world. This new, this new materialism has to be part of a scientific philosophy that seeks to change the world from its current position, not because it is morally right to do so, but because our world shall evolve on forever without our considerations and because that stagnation shall only hinder progress in the march of history. Of course, this doesn't mean we don't have to theorize about our current condition and it doesn't mean that we have to suicide ourselves to hell. No, this is absolutely not what, Kerr, not what Karl Marx is saying here in his 11th thesis. In fact, he wants us to think about our modern conditions, about our modern material conditions. But that interpretation has to be towards the actualization of a communist project coming about in any particular area. To say the line, the line one more time, philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. <sighs> now we are officially done with the thesis of Führerbach by Karl Marx. We shall now move on onto Friedrich Engels' Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. Now, I will say this in the first video of that subseries, but let me state it right now. There are sections, but they are fully developed and not merely only a few paragraphs. Thusly, all the sections I make are simply subsections of a chapter, which in any case, I shall appropriately make it clear the chapter and section we are in the work. In any case, there shall be some downtime, just like before, between the fear back one that I'm currently talking about right now, and the principles of communism. And I shall get to it when I can. Otherwise, as we call Lenin, learn, learn, learn. <coughs> and as always, agitate, educate, organize. Shadavoni, salute.